We've got uh, uh, an incredible guest with us this morning. We are so privileged to have Steve Kramer with us this morning. Steve is he's kind of a walking miracle and, and a, just a true testimony to God's faithfulness. He's got incredible stories. I even found out this morning that his wife knows my grandma and just some crazy things. But man, Steve, is a, he was a radio disc jockey. He was a news anchor and reporter. He's a pastor, he's now a missionary, and he's done so many things, been all over the world, and he has a great word for you guys this morning. Would you just give him a warm horizon welcome? Thank you, Pastor Josh. I have uh, greatly appreciated the hospitality of Pastor Josh and Brogan, and uh, it is so awesome to come back here. We've been coming here for 17 years, and this is the third service, right? So we have unlimited time. I mean, if I'm done by fireworks, we're good. And since fireworks aren't allowed, we could go all night. Uh, But you want to hear my craziest missionary story ever? Well, maybe one of my craziest. Okay, so the first time we're here, and I, I, where's John and Pam Priest? I got to see where they are. Raise your hands. Okay, in the back back row there. Guys, come on, move up. Don't be shy. (laughs) Great friends of ours. We stayed in their uh, house one time when they were over in Cambodia for a year. And uh, that was just a wonderful time. But 2004... We came to this church, wasn't at this location, and we'd always heard of the great church you guys were. A little intimidated, a little nervous. Uh, I think her name was Mama Workman, if I remember right, uh, missionary in Haiti. Just incredible missionary legend. And so I, I must have been stressing. I was recently engaged to my wife. I don't even know if we were quite married yet. We were, we were traveling around. And so I, I bought her this huge engagement ring, like a rock, Right. And during the first worship service, we're sitting in, standing in the front row, and I'm holding her hand, and I must have been nervous because I look down, and my pants are covered in blood. Do you remember this? I mean, this, this doesn't happen every, every week, right? My pants, and I cut my finger. Julie remembers. I cut my finger on the rock that I bought my, my fiancé. And so I was panicked because, you know, you're not going to get mission support doing it this way, you know. Like, and so I uh, found John Priest. He snuck me around the back, and there was this little side room, and there was like some cleaning disinfectant. We were spraying everything possible, anointing oil, shh, get, the, get the blood off, you know. Oh, this, I don't think that's how anointing oil works, you know, and then some like carpet spray. And so the bad part about it was I was supposed to get up and do my little missionary window, but now my pants, they weren't bloody. They were just soaking wet. Okay, you know what that means. Wasn't good. So I'm glad to report that there's been no bloodshed today yet, although our kids, they chose the, the jumpy castle over here and me speak today, so they're grounded for a week. And we'll see how that goes. But my name's Steve Kramer. I'm full of jokes today, especially in the third service. You get a little loopy. You guys find that to be true? And this up here in the front row is my wife, Julie. She is... Uh, and I no exaggeration, m- modern Mother Day Teresa. So that's what you need to know about Julie. And I'm so blessed to be married to her. We have two kids, Case and Selah, and they and they're, were born in the Netherlands when we were missionaries there. So they're tough names to pronounce. And I was so impressed with Pastor Josh because he nailed it every time. First pastor in the history of our mission service to get their names right. And then I realized he had like cheat notes on the backboard. So don't look back there for the, the cheat notes. Um, yeah, we're blessed. But to know a little bit about our ministry, you've got to understand our story. How many people believe that God can do the impossible? You believe that? I believe that. In fact, I believe God loves to do the impossible. See, when I was born, I was three pounds, two and a half months premature. Doctors came in. They told my parents that if Steve even lives, and it was sketchy at that time because uh, that was in the 70s, so what they did to keep me breathing, they tied a string around my toe. When I stopped breathing, they pulled on the string. And uh, not only am I grateful for medical technology advancement, but I also say my life was hanging on by a thread. I mean, it was, it, you know, it was sketchy. And then I had body casts up to my neck. My parents would take me camp, and they hate when I tell the story because they think I'm being serious. But I always say, you know, that I, they prop me up against a tree, and they'd leave me there. You know, and they don't like that part. So, Mom, hi, if you're watching. Um, they didn't leave me there. But, you know, it was a crazy childhood. I remember going to school at Shriners Hospital in San Francisco. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is able to do immeasurably more than we ever could ask or imagine. Amen? In fact, Ephesians and Romans, it says that we have the same power living inside of us that raised Christ from the dead. 
Can I encourage you that, with that this morning that if you feel overwhelmed by your circumstances, that the power that lives within you, the power of Jesus, his resurrection power, is the greatest power ever known to man, to the universe. So we are missionaries to the vulnerable, and a lot of you might be feeling vulnerable. You know, we came out of the pandemic where vulnerable became a key word for everybody. We are, we are missionaries to the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, and we consider that to be special needs families, those with mental health challenges, at-risk youth, and pregnant mothers and the unborn. And you might say, well, I don't know many disabled people. I don't know if you know this, but one in six people in the world are considered disabled. That's almost a billion people. It quite possibly, in my opinion, is the most unreached, overlooked, underserved people group in the world. And then, of course, we know about mental health. We're hearing about it all the time. But 49% of Americans will have a mental health crisis in their lifetime. So our ministry, we're part of a ministry team down in Bakersfield, California. And uh, that's where the international headquarters is. We moved down there, and uh, it's hot down there if you've been to Bakersfield. In fact, I was in the first service. I think it was like 65 degrees. It felt like it or something. That's why I'm wearing a jacket, and I need like a parka and, you know, Bakersfield's hot. But amazing things are happening as we decided that we've got to equip the local church to minister to these segments. It's not just the vulnerable, it's the widow and the orphan. In fact, one of the things that we have planned and we're working on and it's doable for the first time in American history is we're trying to find every foster care child a home in America in the next two years, okay? Now you might go, that's not possible. But we've, we have some incredible people working on it. They've worked at the highest levels of government, working on it. So you can pray for us as we reach the most vulnerable around the world. We're also working in places like Ukraine, special needs orphanage. We were able to uh, pay for seven high-risk uh, surgeries. So like a little girl that plays the piano, she got her hearing, you know, completely for the first time ever could hear her piano playing with both ears. I mean, just amazing stuff. First time ever in the history of Denmark, a local church is starting a special needs ministry. And I say all that to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little more of my time in the third service to just say thank you. Because the money you give to kingdom builders and, and the money you give even to tithing, it, it all ends up making a huge difference. And see, someday when we stand with Jesus and we're having a chat, a little girl, well, she won't be a little girl, woman, I believe, will walk up and say, you know, in the Ukraine, I never could have afforded a surgery, but I could hear with both ears and I played the piano beautifully for God. Isn't that awesome? That's just one thing. That's just one thing. Uh, it's so amazing. Well, I want to show you a video of what God's doing uh, and a little bit more of our story. I'll be back after these messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, City Serve, it's absolutely incredible ministry because they're focusing on the vulnerable, and the vulnerable includes, you know, special needs, mental health. Um, also at-risk youth in the unborn. And you're gonna hear a little bit of my story. I, I, I kind of tie into maybe all of those. Maybe, I don't know about at-risk youth unless you ask my mom. I was born uh, two and a half months premature, only three pounds. Doctors came in, they told my, my parents that if I ever lived, I would never walk, never be productive. I was single till I was about almost 32. And I remember dating this girl. One day we went to the river and getting to the river, I had to like, walk along some rocks and lean on her arm to get to the river. It wasn't really dramatic, but it was, we got down to the river and it was really quiet. And I said, hey, what's wrong? And she said, you know, Steve, I, I can't be married to a disabled guy my whole life. I can't, I can't do it, you know? And, and I remember just feeling like I wanted to jump in the river and just start swimming. You know, I think that was really where it, you're like, man, you know, I'm not sure anybody will ever love me for who I am. So when I met Julie, I remember before we got engaged, I had to ask her, you know, how do you know that you can marry and live with somebody with a disability your whole life? And she said something that really, um, it really set me free. She said, you know, I actually love you more because of your cerebral palsy, because of who it's made you to be. People ask me, when did you start to walk without the aid of anything? And uh, um, 
we went on vacation, I had a couple crutches and I went out to Pismo Beach and one big wave came and just knocked me over and my crutches went out to sea and they sunk. And my mom said, well, that must be a, you know, a sign that you're just supposed to walk without them. And I was really upset at the time. I thought, oh man, that's so cruel. You know, I need those crutches. And uh, I never walked with them you know, after that. You know what, if I would have stayed in a wheelchair, if I would have been a body cast in the corner of a room, Jesus died for me. You know, and it's that same power that's at work within me. It's in work in that, in that person, and they deserve to be loved and included and cared for in the kingdom. See, I've been so blessed because I have a family that love me. They, they're committed to me. They love God. Um, I have a wife. I have kids that love me. Uh, I am so, I'm, you know, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. But there's so many out there, and so many others that they don't have community. They don't have family. I don't have anybody that says, I'll love you and I'll commit my life to you even though you have cerebral palsy. All they know is rejection, loneliness, pain, heartache. And those people deserve the love of Jesus just as much as I do. And that's why I'm not just saying this because it's City Serve, but I really think City Serve, the compassion through the local church, reaching the broken of, of society from the neighborhood to the nations, you know, that this is a message, that this is the message of the gospel. Go out to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. We need to go to them. You know, it's not enough to just wait for them to will themselves to us. We have to find them. You know, every week I show the clip or whenever I show it, I always, there's a little part of me that gets insecure. And I think, man, do I really want to roll out my biggest vulnerability, my biggest fear in life once again? And, and, but I, but I do because I feel like even today, there are people in this room that you're going through your darkest night, just like me on the shores of that river. When I wanted to jump in and swim, I wasn't kidding. I wanted out of there. But can I tell you that God, if you keep hanging on, if you keep trusting him, he somehow makes your path straight and he blesses you. Doesn't mean everything works out, you know, exactly the way we want. But just hang on because he can take your darkest night and turn it into your brightest day. How many have found that to be true in your own life in this room? Amen. That's what God does. Well, today I want to talk about missions and I'm going to go from a little different angle. You know, sometimes... Uh, when missionaries come speak, quite honestly, you know, people maybe that, they think that's not their thing. I remember I was speaking at a big, another big church here in Oregon, and my wife was checking in our kids in the nursery, and somebody was checking their kids out pre-service. They checked them in, check them out, and they, and uh, the lady goes, "Oh, why are you leaving already?" And she and the lady turns, my wife's right there. She says, "Well, there's a missionary speaker today." You know, I'm glad Julie told me that after I preached, you know, that was pretty brutal. But, you know, uh, we're going to go from a little different angle today. I believe missions is the most exciting thing that you could ever be a part of. And that's why we're giving our life to it. And we feel so honored. But a couple weeks ago, we were in Corvallis and uh, we'd just been up to Oregon, first time in a couple years. And we got a text from my sister and it was a family chat. And it said, the mask mandate has been lifted. And it was like celebration on the text, and the kids were ripping the mask off and throwing them in the back, never to be seen again. And it was like party in our, our van for a second. And then God spoke to me something that he's spoken to me many times last year. He just said this, what now? What now? You know, what we wanted has happened. We've gotten everybody back in the building. At least most people that want to be here can be here. And that was kind of a dream. And, and I got to tell you, not to, not to overstate this, but this is so beautiful to be a part of a family. You know, to see the priests, you know, and just pick up where we left off like five years ago or whatever it was, seven years ago. If, you, if you're watching this online and you don't want to come to the building, you think being online is the same, let me tell you something. It's not. You know, there's something about embracing your brother or your sister, you know, and, and even meeting Pastor Josh and these guys this morning. I've never met them before, but I feel like I could talk to them for hours. We're laughing. You know, it's like a cousin out there somewhere. 
Maybe we are related. I check ancestry.com. Um, so the question, though, becomes what now? Because here's the reality, and I'm just a real straight shooter, is that not everybody's coming back to church. In fact, you might have read that church is on the decline. Pastors that I know that had multiple services now do one service, like they're starting all over. What now? What now? So we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 3 to 13. And when I talk about missions today, we're going to talk about a story that maybe you haven't heard. It's a story of Mephibosheth. And to set the stage a little bit, I'll give you a little context. Mephibosheth was the grandson of King Saul, the son of Jonathan. On the days that all and Jonathan were killed in battle, Mephibosheth was five years old, and the nurse who was carrying him dropped him, and this caused him to be lame in both feet. Can I just say that some of the worst things you go through in life are just, you can't answer why. You know, why, why did I have cerebral palsy, which a lack of oxygen somewhere, you know, when did it happen? I sometimes still think about that, like, did, was it a doctor thing? They didn't, like, pull on the string to get me breathing in time. Why were they using a string? Was it in the womb? You know, and there's no answer for that, at least not in this life. And I feel like one of the most freeing things we can say to people, it sounds funny to say this, but sometimes life just happens. It just happens. And it's, life isn't about this quest to figure out all the whys and the answers. It's to figure out the who, and that's Jesus. And you'll see a beautiful story of Mephibosheth. So when we talk about missions today, because I've spent a lot of my life trying to get people to be missionaries on their campus, in their country, and I thought, we've got to simplify this. It's got to be more simple than this. If Jesus, who raised from the dead, his spirit is living inside of us, it's got to be simpler than saying you have to go across the world, although that's tremendously, that's amazing, right? That's a valid call of God. But it's got to be something we can all be involved in. So I'm going to read verses 3 through 13 here, 2 Samuel 9. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there's still a son of Jonathan. He's lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machar, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from house of Machar, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, <coughs> excuse me, that's what Mephibosheth will do to you. I think I just coughed up a tonsil. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. <coughs> David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore you to all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you'll always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to get a little water. Nothing better than pulpit water. <laughs> then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons <clears throat> and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And I just got to make a comment here that a lot of times the funny stuff in the Bible you miss if you read over it fast. I just think it's funny. David invites over Mephibosheth. Turns out there's what, uh, 15 sons and 20 servants coming over too. You ever have anybody like that in your life? Like, hey, can we come over and watch? You think it's just your friend? He brings over 13 people, you know. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. So we're going to talk today what it means to be missional. 
and how we can all be involved. We're going to talk about missions as it relates to inviting others to the king's table. In other words, inviting somebody over to your house, being hospitable, it's one of the simplest things you can do, but that's missions. My first point this morning is inviting others to the king's table is a passionate, passionate, intentional pursuit of others because God has been good to us. How many this morning could say God has been good to you? Amen. Why would King David, who's sitting in his palace, has all the comforts known to man, all of a sudden say, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? I think David was so overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the goodness of God, that he couldn't help but want to share it with others. He remembered the crazy rise to fame when he watched Goliath fall at his feet. And he knew he didn't do it. He knew God did it. He was just a shepherd boy. What about the faithfulness of God when he was running from King Saul all those years? Or how about the forgiveness of God when he fell into adultery with Bathsheba? David couldn't help himself. He had to share the goodness of God with others. See, that's missions. That's missions. I remember when I was 12 in a wheelchair and the evangelist said, if God were to call you to go anywhere in the world, would you be willing to go? And immediately, while physically I couldn't jump to my feet, my heart jumped. And I said, yes. And God said, go to the Netherlands at that time. We spent 10 years planting churches and university ministries in the Netherlands. But I knew I had to go. God had been so good to me. I didn't want to And you hear me the right way here, but I didn't want to waste my life on anything other than sharing God's goodness. Missions is a passionate, intentional pursuit of others because God has been good to us. Now I know we've come out of a hard year, believe me. And that's some of the trepidation of preaching a message like this that's challenging, is I just want to come give you a hug, you know? Let me ask you today, how is your heart for God's mission? Are you feeling unworthy, distracted, maybe disappointed, or even apathetic? You know, this morning when I came in, we got up pretty early. It was early service, so we got up at 5, got the kids ready. And I was pretty tired. I didn't really sleep very well last night. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really feel like preaching the first service. Didn't really feel like it. And I'm sure there are times Pastor Stan and the others get up here and they don't totally feel like it. But there's something that happened when I walked in the room and people were gathered in the corporate presence of God that I hadn't really felt very much watching online or in this past year. Honestly, I think you can experience the presence of God, but there's something really beautiful about being back with the family of God at the feet of Jesus. And all of a sudden, I I was ready to go. Let's share God's word. Let's do this thing. So today, if you're struggling to get God's heart for his mission, get in the presence of God. Just spend time with him. Write down all the times in, in, in your life he's been faithful to you. Inviting others to the king's table is a passionate, intentional pursuit of others because God has been good to us. And here's the thing, the closer you get to God, the more you'll naturally get a passion for his mission. I'm not sure, but I I think it'd be very difficult to have a close relationship with God, not care about his mission, not care about his people, not care about his church. Number two this morning, inviting others to the king's table is a radical, radical invitation of grace. Verse 3 and 4 says, Ziba answered the king, there's still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. He's at the house of Makar, son of Amiel and Lodabar. Now I realize that many times uh, biblical names kind of get a little redundant, maybe even a little boring. But for some reason I felt compelled this time to look up what Lodabar meant. And I was amazed about what I found. Lodabar literally means place of shame or middle of nowhere. 
Anybody ever lived in the middle of nowhere? I used to live in a place called Needles, California, in the middle of the Mojave Desert. You probably ran out of gas there. It was 130 degrees. I mean, that felt like the middle of nowhere. But all of us have lived in the middle of nowhere in our minds when we feel insignificant, like we wonder where our friends are. We feel like we give, 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 and people just take, take, take. That's Lodabar. And that's where Mephibosheth was. And on top of that, there was a custom at the time that the current king would kill all the family of the previous king so there wouldn't be a threat to the kingdom. So possibly Mephibosheth will be put to death when he goes to David's palace. And here David is going against a grain of culture to reach him. It's a labor of love. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. But it's worth it. And you know what? It's going to mess with our priorities. When you get involved with this radical invitation of grace, it will mess with your priorities. I wanted to be a TV sportscaster. I didn't run from the call of God at 12, but for several years I pursued that. I was a CBS News anchor reporter. I was on my way. I remember I was about to hire an agent, make six figures a year, which, you know, that seemed inconceivable and all this stuff. And then God knocked on the door and said, remember I called you to missions? I messed with my priorities. My wife, who's 23, Here's a guy in Medford, Oregon, speaking with cerebral palsy, who's 31. Thinks he's really cute. Right, honey? That's a story I like to tell. She took my prayer card. I saw her out of the corner. I take my prayer card, and I thought, man, I am in business now. Like, this is good. But, you know, it's, it's, it's messed with Julie's priorities, being married to a guy with a disability. And she loves me because of my cerebral palsy, but she still has to carry the luggage. She still has to carry our babies when they're newborns. She's had to sacrifice. But she would tell you, we've had lots of talks about it, it's worth it. And you know what? God's mission is worth it. Are you still out there this morning? All right. One person. Yeah. (laughs) When we invite people to the king's table, we're showing them another kingdom that values everyone. The church is the one place that should value everyone. I remember pre-pandemic, wanted to get a haircut. And I'm one of these guys that just, when I I decide all of a sudden I want to get my haircut, Julie goes, can you wait till tomorrow, wait a couple, no, I want to get my haircut now. So I never register online. Great Clips is always disappointed. Like, you didn't register online again. It's usually a line out the door, you know, and I wait for an hour. Well, I go in this one time, and there's nobody in there except for two hairstylists. And I didn't want to hurt their feelings, so I was like, well, who do I pick? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Sit down in one of the chairs, and I'm talking to this lady, and she begins to tell me about how she has two adopted daughters. One is nonverbal with cerebral palsy, and when she said that, I thought, man, I've been set up by the Holy Spirit. All right, God, what do you want to do? So I ended up telling her my whole story, and I don't think she really understood it, really, at that point. I, I mean, I don't think she was a believer. I don't think she probably understood my cheerful demeanor. But I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to me, saying, I want you to tell her that she's a hero, that she's a champion, that she's a hero in life. So I looked in the mirror, she's still cutting my hair, and I said, you know what, the way you love your daughters, the way you come here to Great Clips and you work endless hours for minimal pay to care for both your daughters who you love equally, you are a hero, you're a champion. And she began to cry. Tears began to go down her cheeks. And I looked over and her hairstylist friend, tears were coming down the cheeks. And the person who came in after me and was sitting in that chair started to cry. We were having revival and great clips. And I, and I don't see that in the book of Acts. I never saw that in the book of Acts that somebody was getting their haircut and they had a, but it was happening. And I invited them to church and to community, the whole thing. See, even though it's a radical invitation of grace, it's very easy to do. What's your skill set? What's God given you? What's he blessed you with? For me, it's a limp sometimes. Because I have a limp, people are drawn to me with disability. For my wife in the Netherlands, she used to invite all non-Christian people over to do art. And then she would say, today we're going to talk about love. And she'd put on worship music, you know, very subtle. And they'd begin to talk about their lives and their pain and their hurt. It's That's missions. It's that simple. Lastly, inviting others to the king's table is a bold witness to a watching world. 
I just want to skip down to verse 13 and read that again. It says, And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always eat at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. You know what's so interesting about this passage, why I love it so much? Is at the beginning of the story, it's all about Mephibosheth's lame feet. That's the headline over his life. Just like for some of you in here, the headline over your life today in your mind is, I'm divorced, I'm, a, I'm unemployed, I don't make as much money as that guy across the street, I was abused as a child. Now listen, those are all real, valid pains, and they should be dealt with. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is it takes our greatest pains, our headlines of our life, and makes them just a footnote. Just a footnote. So it's no longer Steve Kramer, cerebral palsy, all caps, but it's now Steve Kramer, follower of Jesus, lover of God. And the footnote is, oh, by the way, he also has cerebral palsy, if you didn't notice. One of the most incredible things that happens when you decide to spend your life on the most broken is that it confounds the world. It gets our attention. When we minister, we've had so many opportunities to, to bring people closer to Jesus just by what the, we're doing. Because the world kind of knows that the church should be loving the most broken of society. Like they're kind of waiting for us to be the church. Let me ask you today, who's your Mephibosheth? It's not hard to find. Maybe it's someone next door. Maybe it's someone at Fred Meyer that's kind of annoying the next time because they're on a scooter and you can't get your grocery cart past them. And then you stop and you look. And you see that how in the world did they get that all in their car by themselves? Who's your Mephibosheth? Maybe it's someone that you even despised, a homeless person that you saw and you know their story and you know, you know, I guess their legitimate need or whatever, and you go, hey, you know what? I got enough money. I can pay their rent for a month. Maybe I can't do it forever, but I can help them. Who's your Mephibosheth? I'm going to pray right now. And uh, if the Lord hasn't already been speaking to you, I think he put some names on your heart. But can I also say this? I pray every day that somebody will get a heart for a special needs ministry. That we can start one at a church like this, or a mental health ministry, or an at-risk youth ministry, or a pregnant mothers in the unborn ministry. Maybe there are already those going on. It just takes one person with a heart. You don't have to have a doctorate. You just got to have a heart. I was the last candidate you should send to the Netherlands. You know, but I got a speed the light three-wheel bike, and I rode that 2,000 miles planting churches. Who would have thought? Maybe you. Maybe you can reach that Mephibosheth. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God. I love this church. It's like coming home, Lord. It's been several years, but it's like coming home. I love the pastors here. Pray you bless them on their sabbatical, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Stan, who personally has helped me through some difficult seasons in life, through his loyalty, his love, constant encouragement. Who's our Mephibosheth, Lord? Show us today, Lord. Amen.